Whether a block, a cylinder, or a pyramid, a cheese's shape is dictated by concerns with pressure, salt, absorption, ripening, economics, and tradition. Cheeses that are made in wheels like creamy brie and camembert need equal rates of salt uptake, as well as even ripening action from its molds. The wheel shape facilitates both, as the consistent thickness encourages equal absorption as the surface flora spreads, so the disc's shape keeps the mold from focusing too much on one area. Another reason to make a cheese in a wheel, at least historically, is pressure. For example, for traditional rind-covered cheddars, the dry salting method used in their production needs quite a bit of pressure to hold the curd together until it is able to stick on its own. The round molds provide extra strength in pressing, where rectangular molds of the same thickness, even stainless steel ones, tend to lose their shape and even split at the seams over time. As one professional cheesemaker noted on the durability of these molds, design engineers who know cheese plants typically design the item, then double it. A third reason for making cheese into a wheel, particularly for those produced in mammoth proportions, is that you can just roll the large wheel rather than lugging it about. Historically, cheese wheels were often made in these very large sizes for sale in marketplaces, and if you wanted to buy cheese from the market, you used to have to ask the seller to cut off the amount you wanted from these very large wheels rather than have the cheese you wanted to buy prepackaged in consumer-sized portions. If none of these issues are a concern, then making cheese in a block, often from large blocks that are then cut into smaller blocks for consumer usage, is often a wise choice as blocks are easier and more economical to stack, store, and transport over long distances. Other shapes are used as well, sometimes as much to do with tradition as anything else, thanks to modern cheesemaking equipment and environmental controls, pretty much meaning you can use whatever shape you might want. These traditional shapes include cylinders and pyramids, which are very popular with goat's milk cheeses. In fact, in France, the shape of a goat's milk cheese tells savvy consumers instantly where their cheese originated. For example, the flat disc of Banon is known to originate in Provence, while the log of the mild and creamy Montrachet comes from Burgundy, and the striking cheese of Valence, called either Valence or Pyramide, is instantly recognizable for its flat-topped pyramidal shape, and is loved, by the way, for its mildly nutty flavor. And now for some bonus facts. There are several molds that are used in cheese making depending on the desired product. In addition to Pecan Berte and Pecan Didim, a number of other species of penicillium are used as well. For example, to make blue cheeses including blue, Stilton, Gorgonzola, and Roquefort, either P. Roqueforte or P. Glaucum are employed. Able to thrive with little oxygen, these molds work their way through the small cracks inside a ripening cheese. Notably, to encourage even more blue-veined goodness, some cheesemakers actually inject their cheeses with additional mold. Not just restricted to molds, bacteria play a large part in cheese production as well. Vital to the initial formation of a cheese, lactic acid bacteria such as lactococci and lactobacilli eat the milk's sugar, lactose, and help convert it into lactic acid. Although these early bacteria often die off early in the process, for some cheeses like Gruyere and others, some of these bacteria survive to help produce these cheeses' unique properties. In addition, other bacteria may play a role later in the cheese's metamorphosis. For example, Prompionobacter shamani eat acetic acid and produce carbon dioxide, and they're used in making Swiss and Emmental cheeses, where they are key to producing their unique flavors and making those trademark holes. Another bacteria, Brevibacter linens, is used to make some truly smelly but delicious cheeses like Limburger. Breaking down proteins into pungent, smelly, tempting aromas like onion and garlic, bee linens requires continuous washing and wiping of the surface, or smearing, hence the category smear bacteria, to keep the bacteria alive. If the smearing is continued during the entire maturation process, a stinking cheese is produced, but if the washing is stopped midway, the cheese is much milder. On that note, in 2004, researchers at Cranfield University used a machine fitted with sensors that were able to detect the different smelly chemicals of stink, as well as the contributions of 19 humans who sacrificed their noses to determine that Vieux Bologna was the absolute stinkiest of all the cheeses. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. Brand new videos just like this every day of the week. And if you're looking for something else right now, why not check out our podcast? You can find it by searching brain food, one word, in whatever program you use to get your podcast. It's not easy to link to these things, but do go check it out. I promise it's worth it. And as always, thank you for watching.